to one Saturday morning from May 23rd, 2015. I'm Dara Dukes. We're going to start off one Saturday morning with a verdict. If you remember a few years ago, the Boston bombings happened during a Boston um, City Marathon that happened in um, Boston a couple years back. Now, one of the two men that's responsible for it has been sentenced to death. T um, Mr. Tenzanayev, the younger brother, the younger of the Tenzanayev brothers, was sentenced to death after the jury deliberated no more than 15 hours. Now, we'll tell you more details after you first see this clip from CNN. Take a look. Throughout the more than two months of trial, the jury remained focused on this moment. With Jahar Zarnaev and his older brother Tamerlan detonated two homemade pressure cooker bombs at the race finish line, killing three and putting the city of Boston on lockdown. <laughs> Jurors heard days of dramatic testimony from some of the 264 bombing survivors and families of the deceased, like eight year old Martin Richard. His father fought back tears as he described the moment he saw his son after the bombing, telling the jury, quote, I just knew from what I saw that there was no chance. Some comment on the verdict, please? Zarnayev's attorneys, including Judy Clark, argued Zarnayev shouldn't be put on death row because he was under the influence of his older brother Tamerlan, who was using him as a pawn. Death penalty opponent sister Helen Prejean told the jury Monday that she met with Zarnayev and, quote, absolutely believes he is remorseful for his crimes. But the prosecution argued Sarnayev's writings inside this blood-stained boat where he hid from police show he was complicit in the bombing. The defendant claimed to be acting on behalf of all Muslims. This was not a religious crime, and it certainly does not reflect true Muslim beliefs. It was a political crime designed to intimidate and to coerce the United States. The defendant was an adult who came to believe in an ideology of hate. And he expressed those beliefs by killing, maiming, and mutilating innocent Americans on Patriot's Day. Now, obviously in the clip, let me just point out one thing. There was a nun who basically, basically said that Tessa Knife was innocent, that he didn't know, you know, he, you know, he didn't know what he was doing, and the prosecutor's M.O was to say, hey, look, um, he was just following his brother and that, you know, the, the basically, you know, the brother Trigel, who was just following the leader, following the brother, yada, yada, yada. So now they're going to appeal it, which according to legal analysts everywhere, it says that this might take years for this death penalty to be overturned. Next story here on one Saturday morning is the Amtrak, um, derailment. Now, um, this story broke late, um, later in the week after we taped one Saturday morning, which we normally do on Wednesdays, so ensure that you get the news that you need to know um, before, by, on one Saturday morning at 11 o'clock when it's posted on YouTube every Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. So here's the full report from um, ABC News's um, David Wright, which originally aired on their night show, their late night show, rather, Nightline. So um, the report is kind of long, but it gives you everything that you have missed. So take a look. This is what's left of Northeast Regional Amtrak 188. Seven cars tangled on the tracks, killing at least seven people, injuring hundreds more. Even as rescue workers continue to search for survivors, investigators are already trying to untangle this mess themselves. Only now are they starting to put the pieces together. Tonight, we learned the name of the engineer, 32-year-old Brandon Bastian of Queens, New York an Amtrak engineer for the past five years. Police and federal investigators are already questioning him. The question topmost on their minds, 
How come the train clocked 106 miles an hour, more than double the speed limit? We're saying that the speed limit through the curve is 50 miles an hour. Was it human error or a technical failure of some sort? The experts say there has to be some explanation. Tonight, speaking exclusively by telephone with ABC's David Curley, the attorney representing the engineer said police grilled his client for six hours today, but his client has no recollection of the crash. He remembers driving the train. Uh, he remembers going to that area generally. Has absolutely no recollection of the incident or anything unusual. The next thing he recalls is being thrown around, uh, coming to, finding his bag, getting his cell phone and dialing 911. For the 238 passengers inside Amtrak 188, this was a routine trip that turned into a nightmare. The moment of impact caught on nearby surveillance cameras. That flash of light there and there as the hurtling train crashed to a stop at Port Richmond. Did it feel like the train hit something? No, it didn't feel like the train hit anything. It feels like someone slammed the brakes and then the train stopped really shaking left to right. A lot. Passengers thrown from their seats, luggage and laptops turned into projectiles, and tired train cars toppled like toys. Basically, the trains tilted over and rolled. The passengers knew they had to get out, but climbing out the window meant venturing onto live train tracks, sparks flying in the smoldering wreckage. Keep crawling, okay? Crawl forward, sir. Outside, stunned silence. The shock of the tragedy sinking in. It happened in seconds. 928, the first emergency call went out. We're going to classify this as a mass casualty incident. One train there uh, looks like it's completely in pieces. I heard it like a big bang. The walking wounded, bloody and dazed, some climbing out of the emergency exits, others through the roof of the train, survivors stumbling to safety. Pastor Joey Ferjanic heard the commotion. His church is less than a mile away from the crash site. We were at home right around the corner and uh, just relaxing and all of a sudden started to hear choppers, sirens, people were texting us. And so we literally ran out of the house. My wife was in her sandals and we got in the car, shot up to the parking lot over by Walmart. So we thought we could do is just deliver water and Gatorade and towels. And Relief supplies for the first responders and an impromptu welcome wagon for survivors. We didn't want to get in anybody's way. It wasn't about us. We literally were just delivering and also just giving stuff to police officers and firemen. I mean, really anybody who needed something. Emergency yeah. medical technician Danielle Thor helped one woman who'd been trapped upside down inside one of the rail cars for half an hour. Philadelphia Fire was just working their way towards her, but as soon as they got her, they got her into a vehicle and straight to us to take care of her. So she was hanging upside down? Yes, yeah, she said she was hanging tangled in bars from the train. Even for people who suffered minor scrapes or bruises or broken bones, even for people who walked away without a scratch, some passengers were simply beyond help, mostly because the trauma to their heads or their chests was too severe to save them. Their stories are heart-wrenching. Among them, Justin Zemser, two months past his 20th birthday, his mom's pride and joy. He was his high school valedictorian and was just finishing up his second year as midshipman at the United States Naval Academy. He played football for Navy, wide receiver, and was headed home to Rockaway Beach at the end of the school year. His journey home ended here. 39-year-old Rachel Jacobs had texted her husband at 845 last night, telling him she had just caught the train. It was the last message he'll ever get from her. She was CEO of a Philadelphia tech startup, commuting from her home in New York. 49-year-old Jim Gaines worked for the Associated Press, doing digital video, voted AP's Geek of the Month, survived by his wife and his two teenage children. Tonight, Wells Fargo Bank confirmed one of its senior vice presidents, Abbott Galani, is also among the dead. And there are others unaccounted for, too. Tonight, Bob Gildersleeve Sr. passed out flyers with a picture of his son, Bob Jr. Bobby is six foot four, blonde hair, beautiful blue eyes. The number of deaths is likely to climb. The locomotive for Amtrak 188 was brand new, barely a year old. The tracks were inspected just yesterday. The National Transportation Safety Board has already collecting evidence from this box, the event data recorder, telling the story of too much speed. The rail lines north of Philadelphia are straight. The speed limit, 70 miles an hour. But approaching the Frankfurt neighborhood, there's a left corner where the speed cuts to 50 miles an hour. 
But when Amtrak 188 left 30th Street Station at 910 and reached Frankfurt 11 minutes later, it's going 106. By the time the engineer tripped the emergency brakes, it was too late. Bastian's attorney tells ABC News tonight the engineer has a concussion. He was pretty beat up. He's got um, 14 staples in his head, uh, several stitches uh, in his leg. Uh, he has one leg, uh, the other leg immobilized with a knee problem. And he, what he looked was exhausted. The attorney says police have asked for his client's blood and his phone, presumably to see if he was impaired or distracted at the time of the crash. And the attorney told ABC News his client consented to both. Train safety experts say the technology exists for a failsafe able to slow a train down even if the operator does not hit the brakes soon enough. Positive train control is that redundant backup system that will step in and take over and protect all of the passengers. How can we prevent this from ever happening again? We won't know until we have all the answers. And federal investigators say that will take time. I'm David Wright for Nightline in Philadelphia. Okay, back now in the world of sports. Tom Brady has decided to appeal his four-game regular season suspension over Deflategate, where he willingly, willingly know that two people from the New England Patriots defeated some footballs in order to give Brady an advantage of winning games. Um, no, um, you're going to see the story first by Rachel Nichols. After that, we're going to give you some updates on, on that particular story, so take a look. This was expected. This appeal is being bolstered by the Players Association. That's important because their lawyer, Jeff Kessler, has had a lot of victories against Roger Goodell in the NFL in the past. The NFL now has 10 days to set the date for the appeal. And most importantly in all of this is they have the 10 days to set who will hear the appeal, Brooke. Now, Roger Goodell himself can hear the appeal or he can designate someone else to hear the appeal. And he is expected to designate someone else, but who is he going to designate? Is he going to designate someone within the NFL office? He can do that. Is he going to designate someone who has just recently left the NFL office? He's done that before, and those people have tended to rule in the NFL office's favor. Or is he going to do what the NFL Players Association has requested, which is what they call a truly neutral arbiter? Now, in the past, the NFL has not fared very well when a truly neutral arbiter has been appointed. So the NFL is going to have to decide, do they want to take the political hit of appointing someone who is, quote, seen as friendly to them, but get the result that they want here, or are they going to do the more politic thing and to a truly neutral arbiter, but then risk having a lot of egg on their face if a neutral arbiter comes back and says, you know what, we don't think there's quite enough evidence here, and that suspension is repealed. What's that going to look like? So a lot of questions still to come. Hey guys, um, just to give you an update, Sunset Report first, Sunset Report first broke. Um, the owners of the Patriots is um, not happy, to, let me just paraphrase it, with the decision of being fined $1 million for this incident, which um, again, like I mentioned earlier, Brady has been suspended for the first four games of the NFL regular season coming, for the one that's coming up, which he's now appealing. The owner of the New England Patriots is not happy with the, the being fined $1 million, but he's stuck up and said, you know what, we'll, we'll take it, even though I don't agree with it. And um, in a press conference happened this past Wednesday, the commissioner, Roger Goodell, is basically saying that if Brady were to cooperate, it wouldn't help with this appeal. So um, that's where everything stands regarding the flake gate, but stay with us for more details. Now, into keeping it honest. If you remember last week, and I've been reading the, some sites, that George Stephanopoulos, who is the chief anchor of ABC News, co-host of Good Morning America, and the host of This Week with George Stephanopoulos, made some donations to the Clinton Foundation, which pissed off a lot of Republicans because of the fact that he's supposed to be moderating some Republicans' debates. Now, here's the clip of George Stephanopoulos apologizing on This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Take a look. Now I want to address some news you may have seen about me. Uh, over the last several years, I've made substantial donations to dozens of charities, including the Clinton Global Foundation. Those donations were a matter of public record, but I should have made additional disclosures on air when we covered the foundation. And I now believe that directing personal donations to that foundation was a mistake. 
even though I made them strictly to support work done to stop the spread of AIDS, help children, and protect the environment in poor countries, I should have gone the extra mile to avoid even the appearance of a conflict. I apologize to all of you for failing to do that. Well, now, keeping it honest, let me give you my take on it. This shouldn't be a big deal. Why? Because if Republicans remember correctly, George Stephanopoulos, before he got into the career of broadcasting for ABC News, he was working with the Clintons. He helped um, then-President Bill Clinton get into the White House in 1992. He was their communications director um, during that time. And he left the White House back in 1996 to work for ABC News. So, so Republicans had to know that this was this was happening, this was going to happen. Even though George publicly said that, you know, he should have disclosed it on the air and should have got his boss approval for it, but if his boss is at ABC would have known that, you know, he did work for the Clinton, so he didn't need it permission, in my perspective, because, um, let's face it, he used to work for the Clintons. You don't tell a grown man that he needs position to donate money if you're an anchor or on their town because again that's outside their personal life and if the republicans want to get mad let them be mad let them be mad i mean let's face it you just mad because of the fact that you don't think a man of his statue is going to be fair and balanced take that fox news and do things honorably of course he's going to be fair and balanced and do things honorably that i mean let's face it he is a, one of the many good reporters that they have left, and he was just doing something near to and dear to his heart. So, I got two words for you, Republicans: shut up and leave George alone. You can read the full, um, my full link, keeping it honest, on the, um, the News Now Nation's blogger website. Which, if you go to the main page of the News Now Nation on YouTube and go to the About section, the link is right there. So you can read all about it. And if anything, I'll just post the link up in the description page on the bottom of this video. So, yep, that's basically it of this edition of One Saturday Morning. I'm Dara Dukes. Until we meet again, stay gold. And I hope to see you next week around this time. See you later, guys. Thank you.